The way Mark and I met could have been ripped straight from a rom-com, a chance encounter at a mutual friend's barbecue, complete with spilled drinks and awkward apologies. He was charming, with a quick wit that had me laughing despite myself. Before I knew it, we were inseparable, our love story unfolding with an ease that felt like destiny. Our wedding was a dream, a simple yet heartfelt ceremony surrounded by those we loved. Mark, with his career and finances on the rise, was the picture of success. His insistence on a prenuptial agreement was just another part of our planning, a practical step, he said, given our differing financial situations. I didn't mind. My love for him wasn't measured in dollars and cents. Carol, Mark's mother, was a tougher nut to crack. She looked at me like I was an unwelcome guest, her coldness stark against the warmth Mark and I shared. But love has a way of making you overlook the small stuff, and I was too happy to let her disapproval dampen my spirits. Even when we faced the heartbreaking news of Mark's infertility, my love didn't falter. If anything, it deepened. I threw myself into making our house a home, filling it with warmth and love, buying appliances and furniture with my own savings to create a cozy nest for us. But as the years passed, the warmth between us cooled, replaced by a chill I couldn't shake. Mark's demands grew, his once loving requests turning into cold commands. Make sure breakfast is on the table before I leave, Jenna, he'd say, his voice void of the affection that used to lace his every word. And dinner? It had to be fresh, no matter how late I worked, as if my job at the Department of Health and Human Services was just a hobby compared to his high-flying career. I'd wake before dawn, bleary-eyed but determined to cook his breakfast. Then, after a long day's work, I'd rush home, racing against the clock to whip up a gourmet meal that might bring back the husband I once knew. But it was never enough. He took my efforts for granted, never once uttering a thank you, only reminding me that I should be grateful for the roof over my head, his roof. Our conversations, once filled with laughter and shared dreams, now were battlegrounds, his words cutting deeper each time. This is my house, Jenna, don't forget that. He'd snap whenever I dared to suggest anything might be amiss. Each day, as I moved through our home, touching the pieces of our life I'd built with love and care, a thought began to take root in my mind. What if I were alone? The idea, once unthinkable, now felt like a bomb. My love for Mark had been replaced by a weary resignation, worn down by his indifference and coldness. One evening, as I sat at the kitchen table staring at the empty chair across from me, the realization hit me hard. I no longer recognized the man I had married, nor did I see the woman I had become in his reflection. The love that had once been my guiding light had faded, leaving behind a longing for peace, for a life where my efforts were seen, my presence valued. As I turned off the lights and headed to bed, the silence of the house a stark reminder of the distance between us, I couldn't help but wonder, would I be better off alone? The thought was a whisper in the dark, a question I wasn't quite ready to answer. But with each passing day, the whisper grew louder, a call to find myself again, to reclaim the life and love I deserved. Lately, it's like I'm living with a stranger, not the man I married. Mark's been on my case for everything. The house not being spotless, the dinners being too repetitive. It's like nothing I do is ever enough. I've been finding solace in solo trips to the mall, picking out new furniture and gadgets for our home, trying to fill the void with material things. But even that joy is fleeting when I come home to his coldness. It hit me hard when I realized Mark hadn't put a single penny into our joint account for months. All the expenses, mortgage, utilities, groceries, have been coming out of my paycheck. So one evening, I decided it was time to confront him. I waited until he was settled in his armchair, flipping through the channels, and I brought it up, trying to keep my voice steady. Mark, 
We need to talk about the finances. You haven't contributed to the joint account in months. I've been covering everything, I said, hoping for some understanding, maybe even an apology. He barely glanced at me, his eyes still on the TV. And it's my house you're just living in it. Why should I pay for your keep? He shot back, his words sharp as knives. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Your keep, Mark? I'm your wife, not some tenant. I've been paying for everything, trying to make this house a home for both of us, I argued, feeling my temper rise. He snorted, a sound that made my skin crawl. Look, Jenna, you're making a big deal out of nothing. If you don't like it, maybe you should just leave. But we both know you've got nowhere to go, he said, turning back to his show. I was seething, hurt, and angry. But before I could respond, his phone rang. It was his mother, Carol. Jenna, you need to stop this nonsense and start showing some gratitude. Mark's been too good to you, and here you are acting like a freeloader. Carol's voice was like a slap in the face. I was so shocked I barely managed to grab the phone and hang up. I can't believe you and your mother calling me a freeloader in my own home, I said, my voice shaking with emotion. Mark just shrugged, unfazed. Well, if the shoe fits. That night, I lay in bed staring at the ceiling, feeling more alone than ever. The thought of divorce crept into my mind again, more persistent this time. But where would I go? I had no apartment, no real savings of my own. I felt trapped in a life that no longer felt like mine, married to a man who saw me as nothing more than a burden. The next morning, I woke up to an empty bed and a heavy heart. As I made my way through the silent house, every room echoed with the remnants of last night's fight. I knew something had to change, but the fear of the unknown, of starting over from scratch, was paralyzing. Sitting at the kitchen table, sipping my coffee alone, I realized I had to make a decision. Do I stay in this loveless marriage, playing the role of the grateful freeloader, or do I take a leap into the unknown, hoping to land on my feet? The answer wasn't clear, but one thing was. I couldn't go on like this. The breaking point had been reached, and it was time to choose my path. That day at work was a marathon, one meeting after another, no end in sight. I glanced at the clock, knowing Mark would be fuming. Just my luck, I muttered under my breath finally grabbing my phone to give him a heads up. The moment he picked up, I knew I was in for it. This is your problem, Jenna, not mine. You should have been here cooking dinner, not playing around at work. Mark's voice roared through the phone loud enough for the whole office to hear. My cheeks burned as I quickly ended the call, avoiding the curious glances from my colleagues. By the time I got home, it was late way past our usual dinner time. The house was dark, silent, but the moment I stepped in, Mark was on me like a thunderstorm. Where have you been? A good wife would have had dinner waiting. What are you even good for? His words were like daggers, each one slicing through the last bit of patience I had. I was tired, emotionally drained, Mark. I had to work. You know how important this project is? I tried to explain, but it was like talking to a wall. A bad wife and a terrible hostess. That's what you are. He continued, his voice reaching a pitch I'd never heard before. You know what? I've had enough. Pack your things and get out of my house. I stood there, shocked, as he shoved the divorce papers in my hands. You'll be homeless without me he said with a cruel laugh. Something inside me snapped. All the years of bending backward for him, trying to be the perfect wife, vanished. Living in a shelter would be better than enduring one more day with you. I shot back, my voice steadier than I felt. Without another word, I signed the papers, my hand not shaking even a bit. I packed my things into a suitcase, 
the weight of my decision settling in as I looked around the house, our house. It no longer felt like home. It was just a building filled with broken promises and shattered dreams. I booked a room in a nearby hotel, a temporary refuge from the storm. Lying in the unfamiliar bed, I realized this was the first night in years. I didn't have to worry about what Mark wanted for dinner or if the house was clean to his standards. It was just me, and strangely, it felt like a weight had been lifted. The decision to leave was hard, maybe the hardest I've ever made, but as I drifted off to sleep, a part of me felt excited for what the future might hold. For the first time in a long time, I was in charge of my own destiny, no longer tied to someone who saw me as less. Tomorrow, I would start anew, and whatever challenges lay ahead, I was ready to face them head on. After the whirlwind of leaving Mark and finding myself in a hotel room, the reality of my situation began to sink in. It wasn't long before I got a call that would have once sent me spiraling. It was Carol, Mark's mom, her voice dripping with something like Lee. Jenna dear, she practically sang into the phone. I just heard the wonderful news. My boy has finally come to his senses and divorced you. I'm popping champagne tonight. It's a celebration, dear. He made a huge mistake marrying you, and now it's corrected. Her words meant to wound barely scratched the surface. I was past caring what Carol thought. Time will tell, Carol. Time will tell, I replied calmly, a sense of detachment washing over me. A week of navigating through my new reality had passed when I decided to open up to my boss about everything. The burden of pretending everything was fine was too heavy to bear alone. I expected sympathy, maybe some understanding, but what I got was a lifeline. Jenna, I'm so sorry you're going through this, but there might be something that can help, she said, her tone shifting from comfort to businesslike. There's a municipal housing program designed for situations like yours. It offers affordable housing solutions to those in need. I think you should apply. I'll help you. Her offer was a beacon of hope in the overwhelming darkness I'd been navigating. With her guidance, I applied for the program and to my surprise, I was accepted. The relief was immediate. It was like I could finally breathe again. Now I'm renting a small apartment. Modest, but mine. It's quiet, peaceful. A stark contrast to the life I left behind. There's no need to tiptoe around in the mornings. No ungrateful husband to cook for or clean up after. It's just me. And it feels liberating. Sitting in my new living room surrounded by boxes yet to be unpacked, I couldn't help but reflect on the journey that led me here. It's been tough, filled with moments of doubt and fear, but also moments of unexpected kindness and newfound strength. For the first time in a long time, I'm excited about the future. I've got a blank canvas in front of me, and I'm ready to start painting a new life, one where my happiness doesn't depend on anyone else. It's a new beginning, and I'm here for it ready to see where this next chapter takes me. It had been a quiet few months since I started over, finding peace in the simple routines of my new life. Then one afternoon, as I was enjoying a rare moment of calm, my phone erupted into a cacophony of rings. The screen flashed a name I hadn't seen in ages. Carol, my ex-mother-in-law. My heart sank. Why now? Bracing myself, I answered. Hello, Jenna. You need to come back to Mark this instant. Carol's voice screeched through the speaker, so loud I had to pull the phone away from my ear. I sighed. Carol, why would I ever do that? The question was rhetorical, more for myself than for her. Because he's in trouble, that's why. That fool of a son of mine bought shares years back, took out loans, and now he's up to his neck in debt. It's a disaster, and you need to help him sort it out. Her voice was a mix of anger and desperation. I couldn't help but laugh, 
not out of amusement, but sheer disbelief. Help him, Carol. Do you remember the prenup? The one Mark was so eager to have. It says clearly that I'm not responsible for his debts. And let's not forget, we're divorced. His financial mess isn't my problem. There was a sharp intake of breath on the other end. Ungrateful girl. After everything we've done for you, you're just going to abandon him. Her tone was accusatory, as if I had committed a grave sin. Everything you've done, Carol, let's be clear. The only thing you and Mark ever did was make my life miserable. And as for abandoning him, remember, he kicked me out. He made it clear I was no longer welcome in his life or his house, I retorted, my patience wearing thin. You'll regret this, Jenna. You think you're better off without him, but you're making a huge mistake, she spat out, her voice venomous. I took a deep breath, finding a calm I didn't know I had. Carol, I've spent too much of my life living in regret and fear because of you and Mark. I'm done. Mark's debts are his own doing. It's time he learns to deal with his own mess. I'm moving on with my life. Goodbye, Carol. With that, I ended the call, a sense of finality washing over me. I had expected to feel shaken, upset, maybe even guilty. But all I felt was relief. Standing up to Carol, making it clear that I was no longer part of their twisted family drama, felt like shedding a weight I'd been carrying for too long. Sitting back down, I let out a long breath I hadn't realized I'd been holding. The conversation with Carol, as unpleasant as it was, served as a stark reminder of how far I'd come. I had fought hard for my independence, my peace, and no amount of guilt-tripping could drag me back into that chaos. For the first time in what felt like forever, I felt truly free. Free from the expectations, the criticisms, the endless cycle of trying to please people who would never see my worth. I had found my strength, my voice, and I wasn't going to let anyone take that away from me again. As I looked around my small apartment, a sense of pride filled me. This was my space, my sanctuary, and my new beginning. I had survived the storm and come out stronger on the other side. And no call, no matter how unexpected or unwelcome, could change that. The next morning, I woke up with a resolve as clear as day. It was time to reclaim what was mine. I rummaged through my files until I found the receipts for all the items I had poured my money into over the years. The sleek dishwasher that made Mark's life easier, the washing machine we picked out together, though, let's be honest, I paid for, and the high-end coffee machine that became the centerpiece of many of his mornings. It wasn't just about the money. It was about the principle, about not letting my contributions be erased and taken for granted any longer. With a moving truck booked and a couple of strong helpers at my side, I went back to the house that was no longer a home. The door opened to an eerie silence, a stark contrast to the chaos of emotion swirling inside me. As the workers started loading up the truck, I couldn't help but feel a mix of satisfaction and sadness. Each piece of furniture, each appliance had a story, a memory attached to it. But as they say, you can't cling to the past if you want to move forward. Just as we were finishing up, my phone rang. I knew without looking who it was. Mark's name flashed on the screen, his call as predictable as it was unwanted. I answered, bracing myself for the storm. Where the hell is all my stuff? He bellowed, skipping any pretense of a greeting. Your stuff? I couldn't help the incredulous laugh that escaped me. You mean the things I bought with my money? I've taken them back, Mark, according to our prenup. I have every right to. His curses and insults flew fast and furious, a torrent of anger that once would have cowed me but not any more. Listen, Mark, I cut in my voice steady. I wish you the best, truly, but this is where our paths diverge for good. And with that, I hung up and blocked his number, 
a symbolic gesture of cutting the final tie that bound me to a life that no longer served me. As the moving truck drove away, my heart felt lighter than it had in years. This wasn't just about reclaiming my possessions. It was about reclaiming my life, my independence, and my self-worth. I knew there would be challenges ahead, but for the first time in a long time, I felt ready to face them head-on on my own terms. Six months down the line, life had taken a turn I hardly dared dream of. I'd snagged myself a cozy apartment in a neat part of town, all thanks to a social program my boss tipped me off about. The deal was sweet, a manageable down payment with tiny payments stretching out over the years. For the first time, I wasn't just scraping by. I had a bit of wiggle room in my budget, enough to spoil myself without worrying about anyone else's needs or wants. The day I got the keys to my place, I remember stepping through the door, the sense of ownership washing over me. It was a blank canvas, and for the first time in forever, I could paint my life exactly how I wanted, no compromises, no sacrifices, just me. I treated myself to some paints and canvases and tapped into the girl I used to be, the one who found joy in splashing watercolors around, lost in the flow of her own creativity. I even painted a self-portrait, something I'd never have dared do before. Staring at my work, I saw a woman who'd weathered storms and come out stronger, a woman who didn't need anyone else to define her worth. And then there's Max, my little bundle of joy, a scrappy little dog with eyes too big for his face and a heart just as oversized. Adopting him felt like the final piece of my new life clicking into place. We've become a team, exploring the neighborhood, making the apartment our home. One evening as Max and I were curled up on the couch, my phone buzzed. It was a text from a friend I hadn't seen since the divorce. Heard you're doing well. Coffee sometime? I smiled, typing out a reply. Yeah, likes good. Coffee sounds great, my place actually. I've got some art to show off. Looking around my little apartment, my sanctuary, it's funny how life works out. Once I thought I needed a husband, a big house, and a certain lifestyle to be happy. Now I've got a small apartment, a dog, and my art, and I've never felt more fulfilled. Max, buddy, I said, scratching behind his ears. We're doing just fine on our own, aren't we? He barked in agreement, and I laughed, feeling a surge of gratitude for my independence, for the struggle that brought me here, and for the simple joys that filled my days. Now, this was happiness unfiltered and undiluted, and it was all mine. Life had taken a turn I could have never predicted. Just the other day, while having my morning coffee and scrolling through the news on my phone, I stumbled upon a headline that stopped me cold. My ex, Mark, had been declared bankrupt. His house, the one he was so proud of, the one he kicked me out of, had been sold off to cover his debts. Now he's back living with his mom, Carol. I couldn't help the small satisfied smile that crept up on my face. Breaking free from him was the best decision I ever made. These days my mornings are spent wandering to the park with Max, my loyal little sidekick. The fresh air, the peaceful quiet. It's a far cry from the tense, stifling atmosphere of my old life. And it's not just the walks. I found a new passion that's breathed life into my world painting. I joined the local amateur artists club on a whim, thinking it'd be a casual hobby. But it quickly grew into something more. I started exhibiting my paintings at local shows, the vibrant colors and bold strokes a reflection of my newfound freedom and joy. At one of these exhibitions, my path crossed with someone unexpected. I was standing beside one of my pieces, a watercolor that I felt particularly proud of when a man approached. He studied the painting with an intensity that made me curious. That's quite beautiful, he said, nodding towards the canvas. Did you paint this? I couldn't hide my grin. Yeah, I did. Thank you. 
We got to talking, and it turned out we had a lot in common. Before I knew it, we were sitting in a nearby cafe, chatting over coffee like old friends. He was easy to talk to, with a warmth and a sense of humor that I'd missed in my interactions for so long. He even bought my painting. I want to see this first thing every morning, he said. It's inspiring. That coffee turned into dinner a few days later, and then into walks in the park, Max trotting alongside us. He introduced me to his kids, two bright sparks who welcomed me with open arms and laughter. It felt natural, easy, like a piece of my life that had been missing without me even realizing it. One evening, after the kids had gone to bed and we were sitting on his porch, he turned to me. You know, I'm really glad I bought that painting, he said, his voice soft in the twilight. I smiled, leaning my head on his shoulder. Me too. It's funny how things work out. It got me thinking about how far I'd come from feeling trapped and hopeless to standing on the cusp of something beautiful, something new. I was free from the shadows of my past marriage, ready to dive into the future, whatever it might hold. As Max and I continued our morning walks, I found myself reflecting on the journey, the pain, the struggle. It all led me here, to a place of peace and potential. I was ready to embrace whatever came next, open-hearted and free. Life, it seems, has a way of surprising you, of turning the page when you least expect it. And as I walked, the sun breaking through the trees, I couldn't help but feel grateful for every twist every turn that brought me here, ready for a new chapter. I stepped forward into the light.